in lane five. Hey, Autumn Athletes, Larry Sorensen here. And today I'm going to have a conversation with Peter Hawk and find out what makes him an Autumn Athlete that's not done yet. Before we get started, though, please remember, if you like our content, like, subscribe, and ding that bell for notifications. Okay, let's get this started. Peter, why don't you start us off by giving us an introduction. I live in La Crescent, Minnesota, which is on the border over by uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin, and uh, about two and a half hours of, um, southeast of the Twin Cities, and have two kids. I've got a sophomore in college that runs track uh, 400s and 200s at Bethel University up in St. Paul, and then a uh, daughter who's a, a junior this year. Uh, my wife is a teacher. We've been married since 1997. And uh, we just we we love it here in this in this area. It's a very scenic, beautiful place to live. I did quite well in track. That was the only sport that I did all all through high school and and junior high. Did pretty well. Had some school records when I got done there. Went on to run in college, and uh, I was a sprinter in high school. Was not fast enough to to run with the sprinters when I got to college. So got turned into a middle distance runner and was going to run primarily the 800. Ran cross country as well. And for a sprinter trying to run cross country for the first time, came in dead last in a lot of college cross country meets. As I was finishing up my for my senior year, I was going to get to run the 400. Um, so I got back into this, the sprinting and worked my way back in, got in a car accident the very last week of, of schools just before finals and, uh, ended up in the hospital for five days, ended my track career and took some time off, had some restrictions of what I could do mm -hmm. and really got into a lot worse shape than I had ever been in my life. And at some point realized I needed to to fix that and getting back in track and field was kind of my way of doing that. Did you play any other kind of sports or was it just track and field? I, I played basketball in high school and then tennis recreationally. But if I was to choose a sport to be good at, I would have picked basketball. Um, but unfortunately, I just really wasn't that good. I just really liked playing it. When did you start master's track and field? At what age? I did get back into track and field in my mid twenties, uh, to try to get back into shape, tried the longer distance races and, um, always had some calf issues that prevented me from being able to, to sustain running distances for a while. And, and it just really wasn't my thing hard to get into something that you just don't feel passionate about the, the way that I, I like sprinting. So got back into, you know, pure sprinting, very short distances and um, in my twenties, just local state competitions. So you've continued that all the way up through until you started running masters then, or did you take a break? Yeah, I'd run these competitions. Didn't know anything about USA track and field at the time. I just knew Minnesota state games was the start of the North games uh, would run that very low key competition. You could show up and many guys would enter like six events just because they were going to be the only person in their age group. They could collect whole bunch of medals. And so it was the quantity over quality kind of thing, but I could do very well at those competitions. And uh, somebody said, you should check out these USA track and field events. And I had no idea what it was. So I looked into it, got into some state competitions and then saw that the national competition was going to be in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, had a friend that lived over uh, in Green Bay, so like, I can stay with him, go down for the meet. So I don't remember what age I was. It was somewhere mid thirties. So I was in the M35 age group at the time and got completely destroyed. Last place. I, I just knew while I was there, I said, you know, this was other than getting killed. I, this was really fun. A lot of great people here. I like this atmosphere. And I said, to myself, I either have to make a decision. I'm either going to really take this seriously and go after it or just say that's it and I'm and I'm done and I'm not going to do another national competition. Decided hey, I'm going to go for it and uh, ran the next year. Um, was in Cleveland and placed third in the in the 400. After that, I was kind of hooked. Besides that particular incident, were there any people or any other factors that really influenced you or inspired you to 
uh, pursue track and field a little more seriously. One of the guys that I met there at the Oshkosh meet um, was a guy that I had known from the Minnesota competitions and his name is Jim Schaffman. And he was very competitive in his age group. I don't remember where he was at that time, but uh, quite a few age groups ahead of me. And I, I kind of looked at where he was and where I was. And I said, you know, if I could just, I looked at the the time drop off as the ages got older. And I said, if I can just make that a little bit more gradual, eventually I can be competitive here. And Jim was very supportive of just getting more and more people involved, introduced me to a lot of people and, and, um, and he's out of the twin cities too. So that's uh, about two and a half hours away from here. That's where I run a lot of my meets. And so I've, I've met so many good people, but Jim's just, a, a you know, heck of a competitor and a uh, nice guy to, to help people out and, and really get other people involved. So now that you've been running masters and you're in your forties, have you had any other setbacks along the way or any, any other injuries that have uh, put you back at all? Big one a few years back was um, I started having this kind of pain in the upper part of my hamstring and just kept thinking it's tight. And, and, and I'd had a number of hamstring injuries before um but it, it, this one was different where it just it burning pain there and i would stretch it and stretch it and stretch it and yoga and everything i could do to to try to get it to go away and it just got worse and worse and eventually realized that and had a ct scan and found out it was proximal hamstring tendinopathy um which is the tendon issue where it connects to your, to the ischial tuberosity. So kind of where you're, where you sit diagnosis that I could find was not great. And for recovery. So, uh, tried some different things, got, uh, PRP injections and, um, drove to Chicago numerous times and did that. And then really wasn't getting a lot better. And I realized that running, maybe not only is it just something that competitively that I like to do, but it's a, it's a mental health type thing too, that that was um, one of the things that really gave me joy and, and taking that away was just was tough. Mm -hmm. So I um, said, I got to kick this. So I looked up everything I could found uh, there's a podcast on, on uh, proximal hamstring tendinopathy. There's numerous videos, there's all these things and just assembled a rehab program and started working on that. And eventually I'm at the point where I can run. I, I still feel it, um, but I can run through what I have. And so, but that was a couple year process of kind of getting through that and really having to not train at all for a while. I took six complete months off of everything and really didn't help. And what I found was that uh, with that particular condition, resting it doesn't help. Progressively loading it and making it have to heal itself was, is what helps. So that's just a, now that's an everyday part of my routine that I go through every week. And, and uh, hopefully I can keep that held off as long as possible. The other, the other <laughs> thing. Um, so I did uh, right before COVID, I had taken a 23 and me test and found out that um have alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency which is a deficiency where the uh, antitrypsin gets stuck in my liver doesn't make it into my lungs and the byproduct of that is that i have as a non-smoker healthy fairly healthy person i have emphysema um, moderate to severe emphysema which for a runner and athlete is not a great thing to, to have. I'd been feeling that coming on for a while and talked to my doctor about it a couple of times. And uh, he's like, oh, maybe, maybe you're just, you're used to a certain level of activity. And, and so you, as we get older, these things are going to go away, but um, he tested me for it. And it, when the results came back, um, I was severely deficient. So I have two bad genes for the condition and and have since gotten on augmentation therapy so that um, even though I don't get the antitrypsin in my lungs, now I get it through a plasma donation that I have to go through every week 
um, an infusion at an infusion center. Kind of walk us through that a little bit. How, how do you still manage to run the 400 meters and, and what's the different effect maybe that that has on you now compared to when you were a little bit younger before this uh, became an issue? Well, my training has really changed. I think that's the big thing. I'm having to take longer time periods of rest in between, which for the 400 was really kind of the way that, that I would train is very short rest periods, trying to do repeat 200s is a very common um, 400 meter training. And so I focused more on pure speed all out. Um, so that's become more of a focus. I, I still do the other and it just hurts a lot more <laughs> than it did before. <laughs> just not a great feeling to to not be able to breathe. And that's kind of, it's almost like you're, you're underwater or something's blocking air getting in. So, and sometimes I'm wheezing during races. Um, but I always find I can get through the race. Okay. So the, the training is really the big thing, but it's just hard to catch air, but you know, considering the alternative, um, I, I think I'm probably in pretty good shape compared to what a lot of people with this condition have. And the fact that I was able to get on augmentation therapy, it, I can't regain anything that I've lost. So the emphysema that I have now is what I have unless I either get a lung transplant or, or some other kind of a surgery to remove the damaged parts of my lung. But I think I'm doing pretty well with what I have. And they said the best thing that you can do for this condition is exercise, work your lungs as much as possible. So when I heard that, it almost like it, put it into another drive for me to say, all right, I know this hurts and it, it doesn't feel good to do this, but it's the best thing that I can do for myself right now. So, so I think in some ways, maybe, maybe track and field is, is helping me preserve some of that lung function. Tell us a little bit about your accomplishments and achievements. Going back a couple of years ago with my, the team club that I'm on mass velocity, uh, we had an M45 group and we went to Milrose Games, won the Milrose Games 4x400 Masters event that they do in the morning of the Milrose Games and broke the M45 American record. They'll run Mark Silverman on the second leg. Mass velocity with pack. Coming up on 1,200, Peter Hawk will anchor. Mass velocity, Garmin runners, Greater Philadelphia. And here is your leader. This men's masters four by four, they led it from gun to tape, mass velocity. Um, And then this past year, we, we did it again. So a little bit different group of guys. A couple of us were on the team from the year before, but um, so we took another three seconds off of the record and we're able to win again. So that's just a fun experience. Anytime you can do a a team event like that and on a larger stage, like at the armory in New York city, that's, that's just a kind of a cool thing to do. And then national championships um, going back to indoor of last year, I've had a lot of second place finishes. So, so um, no first place uh, individuals. We've, we've run some relays that, uh, that we got golds in, but um, as far as the individuals in the 200 indoor last year, I got second place, 400 indoor, second place, 100, 200 and 400 outdoor second place in each of those. But one of the really fun things also was I ran at the world championships in Torun, um, Poland and was on a four by two team that um, we got the silver medal at that meet. So it was really just a great experience, uh, fun to be there. And also just kind of fun to be part of team USA. Also my track club mass velocity uh, awarded me the male masters athlete of the year for this past year. And, and then Minnesota, I got the, uh, Minnesota male masters athlete of the year. How about some PR times? What are you, what are you running in these twos and fours and well, one hundreds for that matter too? In high school, my fastest time that I can remember running is 23.5. So eh, that's super fast, but 
the time I ran last year at Outdoor Nationals. So now this is going from when I was 17 years old, ran 23.5 to almost 50 years old, I ran 23.58. So I'm so I'm happy with that ability to have, you know, when I talk about having that slow decline yeah. of speed, I've in some ways been able to to maintain and, and even do better. And maybe that's because of the more speed work that I've been doing. Because my 400 times have, have not been going at the same rate, yeah. but done pretty well there. And, uh, and also kind of added in the indoor 60 meter and the outdoor 100 meter, which I really hadn't done before. Those are very competitive events, especially in our, in this age group. So, so I'm happy with where I've been able to kind of fit in. Um, and some of the shorter sprints this year. And what are you um, running your 400s in right now? So my my 400s last year I was 54.24, and then uh, just ran a 54.9 on a non banked track at the Minnesota Championships, which is uh, which was the Minnesota record for that meet. What are you training for right now? Do you have any uh, up and coming events that you're working towards at the moment? So next week is the uh, indoor championships um, in Chicago. So planning on running the 400 and 200 there, and then not sure about the outdoor season. Uh, I've got my eyes on Sweden running the outdoor world championships. Um, that's probably going to come down to a financial decision of, of whether or not we can pull it off. And then Sacramento meet starts the day before my birthday. And so the meet will start. I'm 49. I'll turn 50 the next day but I, I have to run in that 45 to 49 age group. So I'm not sure if I'm going to do that one or not, but the outdoor championships, I'll be 50. I've been 50 for a month. So um, sometimes being at the, at the lower end of that age group is a, a pretty big advantage. So that's kind of why considering the world championships that this would be a good year to try to do that. So take us through uh, your current training regimen. Take us to the track today and uh, give us your go-to workout. My speed days and probably my favorite workouts are 10 meter flies. So I've got the free lap system. I've got it timed out now where I've, I've got it on my, my watch. So I just put the chip on, goes to my watch, put a couple of cones yeah. down that start and stop the timer and can run through and the time automatically goes to, to my watch. And I don't have to sit there with a pad and paper and write everything down. I can just transcribe it all when I get back home. And I have a lot of notebooks and, and spreadsheets and everything with times that I can compare things and where I'm at. So I adjust the distances a little bit and keep things fresh, but for the most part, that would be a pure speed day is something short, you know, 10, 20, 30 meters multiple times and just see how fast I can go. And otherwise it, it might be multiple 200s. I got a, a number of workouts that I like to do that because I've done them in the past, it gives me a good comparison of where I'm at. So 150s, um, sometimes an all out 300 with three 200s afterwards. But on a pure speed day, 10 meter flies would be my go-to. How about off the track? What do you do? You know, weight training, cross training, what's, uh, what's your regimen there? A lot of what I try to do is um, and getting a lot of this from my hamstring tendinopathy issues, a lot of it's prehab type things where I'm um, working on flexibility, working on training specific muscles that are going to keep me from getting injured. So some plyometric type things, some jumping, moving around, um, and then a little bit of weightlifting, but lately dropped the weights down. It just helps me to be able to work out the next day better if I'm not really sore and having to recover from a previous really hard workout. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of rehab stuff, foam rolling and, and, uh, recovery type things of so jumping in Norma Tex almost every night, anything I can do to keep my body going is, is beneficial. Speaking of recovery, how do you fuel your body? Give us a little uh, idea of your approach to diet and nutrition? I used to be very regimented on like writing down specific things and trying to hit the the right macros for, for proteins and carbs and everything. And what I found was just a couple of pieces, a piece of advice that I got from somebody on the track one day was 
he said, don't eat anything after seven. And so I, I just kind of started doing that. I realized, you know what, the things I'm eating after seven, probably like ice cream and uh, you know, <laughs> cookies or things like that. So yeah. it keeps that out. And, and I think also from, you know, when you look at intermittent fasting, that eating window, it extends that, that window a little bit, but um, I do like to eat. So I eat every two to three hours. I'm eating something. Sometimes it's a protein bar. And I just try to avoid anything that's just, just sugar, but I don't restrict anything either. Cause I find that as soon as you do that, that's what you want the most. So I was at my chiropractic office this morning and he gave me a uh, Reese's peanut butter egg thing or a heart thing. I don't know what it was. Yeah. And uh, I ate it right away. I was like, yeah, I'm going to eat this. So I don't have to look at it all day, but that's probably my weakness is the uh, peanut butter Reese's peanut butter things. But otherwise I just, I stopped being super restrictive on things, but it's just trying to get good whole foods, bring vegetables and fruits with me every day to, to work. So I've got them available and uh, to bring a bunch of bars. I have them stacked up in my um, cubby at work so that I've always got something good there. So I don't just go to the vending machine and, pick up a candy bar. Is there anything that you would have done differently if you could go back? Yeah, I think I probably would have started the prehab things a little earlier and avoided some of the the injury shutdowns that I've had to had to go through. And I think otherwise, you know, if I could talk to a much younger self, like a high school self, I would have said, work hard because <laughs> you won't regret working hard. Yeah. You'll regret not working hard. And, um, so I, I wish I would have treated some of the workouts a little bit better back when I was younger, but, um, I think maybe that's part of my success now is just a mentally tougher than I was back then. You had to come up with, uh, what I call a secret sauce for, you know, life in general, being a motivated master's athlete at 49 and, or if you have something specific for track and field athletes, um, tell us what your secret sauce would be. I think one of the biggest keys is just being consistent. So get on a schedule, it, it, you know, figure out a time that's going to work to get your workouts in. Uh, for me, it's in the morning. So something else doesn't get in the way. So every day, 515 or 530, I'm, I'm up and I'm doing something and I'm just in that routine. So even if it's an off day, I'm still getting up and I'm probably just foam rolling or, or doing something to keep in the habit. But then also I think, um, you know, the best ability is availability and keeping yourself healthy, listen to your body, because once you can kind of get in tune with something's a little wrong, I need to back off here or times that you can go a little further when you, when you get in tune with that, um, then things tend to fall into place pretty well and, and performance will, will be better. Thanks, Peter, so much for joining us today. I'd like to close up the session by giving you a chance to uh, give us some final thoughts to the audience. You know, if you're thinking of uh, track and field, it's a super welcoming um, community of people. And um, I, I've been going through photos of past meets and everything. And just, I think the biggest thing that I get out of it is not not just the competition, but it's the relationships that you make with the people that you meet there. And you will not, you're very unlikely to meet a unfriendly person at a master's track and field meet. And uh, I've met many people that now we're friends for life and bonded for life just because of, of track and field. Well, there you go. Peter Hawk. He is definitely an autumn athlete that's not done yet. Remember, folks, keep moving, set those goals, and train hard to achieve them. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.